Hey friends, welcome back to another Field and Garden podcast. It is your friend and host, Lisa Mason Ziegler. And friends, if you're listening to this on your favorite podcast app, I just want to let you know that I decided today to actually make a video to go along with my podcast because what I'm talking about today is actually displayed behind me. So you can jump over to my YouTube channel um, and actually see a little bit of what I am talking about while we um, have our chat today. So friends, if you're new here, I just want to welcome you. Um, I really appreciate how you guys um, like and share the podcast and post reviews because guess what? That's what makes it possible for us to do more and more because that tells your podcast app or YouTube, if you're listening over there, when you like it, subscribe and share it, that you like it and they'll show it to more people. And that's what kind of makes this whole ball of wax come together, right? So friends, this podcast, Field and Garden, is brought to you by thegardenersworkshop.com, where you can learn all about the work that we're doing, um, helping people, no matter the level they're at, to grow lots of cut flowers, whether in the backyard or for profit. Did you know that the Gardener's Workshop offers seed starting supplies? On our site, you'll only find the equipment that we love and use ourselves. It's all Flower Farmer approved. So visit our online store today at thegardenersworkshop.com. The Gardener's Workshop, turning all thumbs green. So friends, today I want to talk about dried flowers. So, you know, dried flowers and we dry it all. That's what I want to just come out of the gate saying, um, because I think I often hear, oh, well, will that dry Well, I never knew the answer to those questions, and that led me down this path that I'm going to tell you about today. So first off, all of, you know, for 25 years as a cut flower grower, my goal was always to sell it all fresh because that's the least amount of inputs required by us as the business before it goes to the hands of the people that are actually going to be end user, right? Right. And I was often asked, oh, well, do you dry those too? Because we, of course, have a huge um, patch, or actually, let's see, three huge patches of hydrangeas here on my farm. And people always would see them fresh. And because when we used to go to market, right, for all those years and say, oh, but do you dry them? Well, I'm going to talk today about what happens to the stuff we don't sell fresh. That was the whole point of me drying. We did not set out to dry product. Our goal was always to sell it fresh because that meant we harvest it, we fixed it, whether that meant bunching it or putting it in a bouquet and then sold it and it was gone, right? Um, Drying it does not necessarily bring you additional income from that stem, but it definitely requires extra work. (laughs) And so we always, I never was, uh, oh, let's grow extra to dry. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that in my business model, our goal was always to grow, to harvest, and to sell it gone. Um, And what we're doing now is kind of an added bonus. Actually, we call it added value product, right? So um, why did I not want to also grow additional to actually dry? Well, if you're flower farming, I'm sure you can relate to this. Just like you had no idea all the things that were required to become a real professional flower farmer, all the stuff you needed, all the steps you needed to learn, all the things you needed to do. Well, dried flowers have their own set of those things, right? I mean, There's new pests to consider if you're going to be sitting on dried flowers, you know, moths laying their eggs in them, storing it. How do you, I mean, what do you do with it? How do you sell it? What market? So that is what always kept me from pursuing dried. It was like, it literally is like starting a whole second business, right? Um, And also Bobo would be very quick to say, and dried flowers make such a blooming mess. I mean, every time you touch them, they get a little confetti everywhere. So if you're watching on YouTube, this wall behind me is dried flowers. 
Um, and this is all the trash that was accumulated. Um, let's see. So this is 2023. So this is 100% all product that we have dried this year. There is additional product you can't see that's stacked on the floor. This is a temporary wall. And I'll talk later about what we actually use dry flowers for, which is really different than what most people um, hat would do. But every time we rearrange and move these, the floor gets confetti. And that's just one more piece of how um, dried flowers are really different than fresh flowers. So what do we do with them? How did, what is this all about? So I learned from one of my good friends who is also um, an instructor here for the Gardener's Workshop, Ellen Frost of Ellen Frost Flowers. And her business name is um, Local Color Flowers. She's a designer in Baltimore that just has a design studio. It's not really a kind of conventional brick and mortar florist type shop. But what's different about Ellen is she only uses local product. Everything she uses year round, by the way, y'all, um, is grown within a hundred miles of her Baltimore, Maryland business. And so being the frugal and smart businesswoman that she was, when she started doing that 15 years ago, she kind of never wanted to throw away any of the stems that were left over. And if you're new maybe to the flower farming business, or maybe you've just never been in this part of it, there's a thing called shrinkage. And shrinkage is what, whenever there's a fresh product, whether it's vegetables at your grocery store um, or flowers, shrinkage is what gets trashed that the merchant had to buy that they didn't sell it in time, right? It, it goes to waste. And Ellen, we know that in general, it's like a 30% shrinkage in flowers and produce um, in stores. Um, side note, sometimes if you wonder why a retailer has to charge what they have to charge for a fresh product, well, they not only have to pay for what you're buying, they have to also pay and make profit up and above the cost of what they had to throw away also. So that's just, you know, a little side note there. So Ellen did not want to throw anything away. So she began hanging everything that was left over um, to dry. And in most flower shops, that would happen on a Monday morning. They've gone through, you know, the week of busyness. They buy, get their flowers in typically on Monday or Tuesday um, they come in Monday morning and they usually clean out their coolers, see what's still usable, da, 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 da. Well, that's what Ellen did, except Ellen, instead of trashing those flowers, which is what most, what everybody else seems to do, Ellen hung everything to dry. Because guess what? Because I'm recording this um, October 30th. Um, we're going into the month of November and the month of November in the flower world often warps right into dried wreaths, dried flower um, products, right? So Ellen would dry all these flowers all season long. So the month of November, they start creating from her leftovers, all of these flowers that they have been dried. And y'all, so I knew that, but I still didn't kind of understand it. And then in um talking with Ellen as she became one of our instructors and we were doing all these lives together about, she has two courses with us, preparing to sell to florist, which is awesome if anybody's selling to florist. And then also growing your business with local flower sourcing, which is a bigger course. And friends, I'm telling you, florist and flower farmers benefit from that class. Anyway, um, as we were together um, marketing these courses, I came to learn that she literally hung everything to dry. She doesn't hem and haul and waste time thinking, I wonder if that dries well. They just made it their practice. And here's the other really important step is she doesn't want to do, I mean, of course, because you know she has employees just like I do. We don't really want to invest any additional money on money we've already spent that didn't get used, right? So you're already dealing with a product um, that's headed into its second use opportunity. So they literally just hung what they did. They didn't because um, people often say, oh, do you spray them or do you treat them or do you do this? We don't do anything. 
That's what I did. I do exactly like what Ellen told me to do. I, we literally, as Ellen did, literally just rubber banded those bunches and hung them to dry. And so what this can become for you as a flower farmer is an incredible added value product. So I'm just going to hit pause for a moment and say, so I know that in the farmer's market, you know, we did farmer's markets for 14 years and then we had our members only market here on the farm. And I know that October and November are almost as high demand as spring is. So the sky's the limit, y'all. So that's why I feel like in addition to those fresh crops that you would be growing um, to have fresh during this season, you know, eucalyptus and peppers and amaranths, I'm looking around y'all, hairy balls, um, all the basils, the cut flower ornamental kale. We still have coxcomb and gumfrina, and there's even a scraggly zinnias. And of course, y'all, all the sunflower colors, right? So in addition to all this amazing fresh product, now you can have some dried product. Whether you take it to the market in sleeved bunches so they don't fall apart all over the place, or you make dried wreaths, or you make little nosegays for people to stuff in their Christmas tree, or whatever. You know, think about this two-month period of October and November between the fresh product that you're still bringing out of your garden, perhaps, these dried flowers, which have potential, you know, for wreaths, crafts, straight bunches, um, bouquets, whatever you've got. And then I'll even punch this in here. I mean, think about your booth. Then if you do some of the forced bulbs that we always did for this time of the year, the amaryllis and the paper whites, if you have not taken um, Val Shermer's course with us, it's like 50 bucks. Um, it's, I don't remember the official name. It's Forcing Glorious Bl Blooms for the Holidays, I think. She gives you the lowdown on how she Y'all, I mean, you can't imagine what's in this class, how she jump starts paper whites and amaryllis to make these incredible containers that are high dollar over the top um, potential products to sell. Anyway, you can found, find all that at thegardenersworkshop.com. But I'm in just envisioning in my mind, you could have a booth like you couldn't even have during the fresh season. Think about beautiful containers with bulbs, not blooming, but shooting up. Thinking about dried product. If you don't want to make wreaths, like I probably wouldn't, sleeving dried product and selling them, you know, three bunches for X, Y, Z. Have your fresh stuff. I mean, that's really pretty dadgum amazing. So you're taking these products that are leftovers and making um an amazing added value. And when you wrap that added value up with your fresh and potentially bulbs, um, totally amazing. All right. So what I've learned um, by do, so I've been doing this now, let's see. So last year and year before last. So this is our third year of actually saving flowers and dry. I mean, are y'all seeing what's behind me? Look at these vibrant colors. It's pretty amazing, right? So this is my third year of doing it. And what I have learned is we just, I do just like Ellen does. I don't want to invest any additional labor in these flowers. A, because we are, obviously, we don't, we aren't selling flowers anymore, right? Um, we grow flowers now for educational use, for what I'm doing right now, right? In our online courses and writing books and all those such things. And our big live harvest shopping shows that we do on Friday inside our phone app. So I have to have fresh product there, but then we have nothing to do with it. We gift so many bouquets, y'all. So we're already doing that. We take them to police departments, to nursing homes, and we do that throughout the season. But we produce a lot of flowers, right? So my use has now become my added value is we dry these. And this is a temporary wall behind me. But we make these big backdrop walls of these dried flowers to be used all winter long during our live shopping show or any of my lives. I can do lives and not have to worry about what's behind me, but have a result. I mean, this is priceless.
this is priceless to me in what the step that my business is in right now, which y'all do know it changes all the time, right? So we have learned that we, so we have this show on Friday, which is what makes us harvest on Thursday, big harvest. We show all the fresh flowers and I talk about them, da, 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 and they're already rubber banded. We literally just put an, a second rubber band on there because they one always breaks and we have hooks and we literally hang them from the ceiling in here um, in this building. And what I have learned is that about 95% of what we grow dries. What are some of the surprise ones for me? Buplurum, which Ellen said is one of their most favorite ones to actually, um, that she said that Buplurum, which I actually think is right there. That's what that is. Um, that Buplurum is always the first one to get used when they are making wreaths. And y'all, dried wreath, beautiful, locally done, abundant dried wreaths, um, command a great price for your labors. Um, so, we have found that most everything, what doesn't, what hasn't really dried worth it for me. Um, there's just a couple of things that we just don't waste our time drying anymore. And that is zinnias and basil. And they may dry better for somebody else, but at the state that we harvest them in, because there's just too much moisture content, um, you just, they just really don't dry well. And I do want to say this. Um, I skipped over it when I was talking about my hydrangeas earlier. Um, one of the things Back before we got into the supermarket bouquet making business, which consumed every standing stem on this farm every single week, before that happened, um, we would use, we would sell our hydrangeas and their big mop heads. Um, we would sell our hydrangeas fresh to all of our florists and would sell them at farmers markets. Then as we would have way more than we could ever sell fresh because I had so many, I would then make a special offer to my florist and say, hey, the hydrangeas are like moving into that papery feel. It's time that they be hung, you know, they can be hung to dry and I will harvest them and sell them to you at the fresh price. But you can dry them and use them all winter long for whatever it is you want to do for them. It was just I was basically doing the same work, charging the same price. But I was giving my florist a different idea of how to use the hydrangeas. A, they could hang them to have later or they could use them. Um, and then I would also market them at the farmer's market that way. Just take them home and let the water dissipate in the vase and they'll be fine. Um, so I just wanted to mention that, that we didn't dry hydrangeas to sell them back when we had them um, abundantly. Um, but that was just a new marketing ploy for me um, to actually sell them that way. Um, but then once we started doing supermarket bouquets, you better believe there was a hydrangea in every mixed bouquet as filler and people loved it and it helped fill up bouquets. All right, back to the party here, right? So, so those flowers that we don't use as dried now, which are basically, I'm just thinking pretty much just basil and zinnias. Um, and so we just compost those like we used to do with all of this that would be left over, right? So again, I just want to say that um, there's nothing wrong with drying flowers to dry, but I never did that. My first plan of action, plan A, was to grow it all, sell it all fresh. Then it would be plan B, what was left over, hang it to dry, um, to create added value products for the month of November. And I would also say that I would resist um, probably offering those dried things any sooner than October and November because A, people are thinking about dried stuff. Dried flowers are back in if y'all haven't figured that out yet. Um, so also taking that type of stuff to market, if it's humid, if there's humid humidity in the air, could be a problem. And when you take them out um, in that type of weather, then moths can get on them and lay eggs. And that's what leads to your problem. So you don't want to take them and think you might not sell them. You want to take them when you boom, sell them and be done with them, right? So here are the steps that I actually took when we to air dry. Again, I will say we do not take any 
extra steps other than um, we have an extra rubber band on um, that we add that we put the um, hooks on and we just have chains hanging across the ceiling here and that's where we hang them. Um, and so again, we dry everything. We try it at least a couple of times. And, you know, then there's those, and I'll just point out what maybe some of these are. I'll just point a few right here directly behind me. That's fever few, fever few actually dries beautifully. This is safflower, carthamus, Status, of course, dries beautifully. Gumphrena. These are amaranth down here below. This is amobium. Strawflower, giant poppy pods, peppers, eucalyptus, lots of grasses. That's um, limelight millet. Over top of my head is gumphrena. There's more um, fever few. And then right dead in the middle, that orange right there are marigolds. So pop over and check out YouTube if you want to see what all of those are. But those, many of those we know dry well. But some of the unlikely suspects, I'm just going to look, of course, um, nigella. Marigolds are a really great one and hold a bright color. Um, and I was really surprised, you know, pumpkin on a stick, which would, you know, does well. Our Texas plumes do beautifully. So y'all, you just don't know till you do it, right? So that's what I'm saying is we hang everything. I don't waste a lot of time thinking, oh, will that dry? Well, let's just do it. And sometimes drying at different stages also happens. So I have learned that fully open blooms tend to dry best when we're talking about air drying, y'all. Um, open blooms seem to do best. They're already stripped because we, you know, harvest them as fresh flowers, right? So that's not a problem. We add that extra rubber band. Um, also, the stems shrink as they dry. Um, so the second rubber band just really helps to secure that. I mean, it happens. I'll come out here and there'll be a bunch of flowers all over the floor where the rubber band, somebody didn't add an extra one, the rubber band dry rotted or they shrunk and it just fell apart. So that's why we do that. The reason you hang these upside down is because they're not dried. You know, they're fresh and you're taking them out of water and you rubber band. If you just left them like that, they're going to droop like flowers do without water, right? So hanging them upside down allows them to dry in the way you want them to look. The only thing that we don't hang to dry that we keep them st standing upright would be like a hanging amaranth, you know, like love lies bleeding that you want it to be drapey. So just think about how do you want it to look when it's actually dry. The other thing I want to say, if you know, I mean, let's just say you have a boatload of gumphrena. That's not old, y'all. If you harvest old flowers to dry, they're going to fall apart. Don't even waste your time. Um, if you have a bunch of gumphrena and you want to make some really quick money makers, make some gumphrena wreaths. And what I did is I just stood out there and actually harvested like the top four to five inches cut little short stems and rubber banded these little bunches that would probably be about as big as my fist on the top. Um, so they're ready made. They're ready to be put on a wreath, right? Um, so they have to be dried first. But added value, y'all, one less handling um, of the flowers. So, you know, everything you read says a warm, dark, well-ventilated place. Well, this room is rarely ever dark, except probably for 10 hours overnight. Um, but it is a AC and, and H, it's HVAC. We keep it at probably about 70 degrees in here. Um, and they're hanging upside down. Um, so just a dry place is really, really important and well-ventilated, which I think we give that here. Um, and so we literally leave ours hanging on the ceiling until we're ready to use them. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's really difficult to handle dried flowers. They just tend to confetti. So we leave them there. Um, and as a flower farmer, I am saying, unless, unless you are a big dried wreath person, do not store dried flowers. You need to dry them and use them. Dry them and use them. Um, you know, you don't want to, if you put them away in boxes, what is the likelihood that you will ever use them? If you know you're going to use them, that's one thing. But I think that what happens to a lot of people is they spend a lot of time and money boxing, tissue paper, putting these dried flowers in boxes. And it takes a lot of boxes. I mean, it would take so many boxes to store these flowers that are behind me. 
that know what you're going to do with them right before you actually go through this process. So let me just tell you what we're going to do with these. So we are, um, you know, we were able to clear this building to create bigger sets for our live shows. And so we're designating one whole area from floor to ceiling and about 10 foot wide is our goal for all dried flowers, like what you're looking at. Um, so I'll have a backdrop to do anything that's just interesting, right? Um, so I know where my stuff is going. But if you don't, don't waste your time. Wait until next year. Just, just planting that seed there, all right? And so I've already mentioned that what the biggest moneymaker would be reeds. However, they are labor intensive and you have to know how to do it and that they hold together, that they are securely done. So you need to research how to actually make reeds. Um, dried bouquets, I would definitely sleeve them or sl dried. The easiest thing to do is to just sell the bunches the way that they're rubber banded, drop them into a paper sleeve and that's how you sell them, right? So friends, I hope this will boost your fall bottom line. I don't have any... Um, low down on any secrets. It's just, I look at this like I do with everything in business. All right. What's the, the least amount of steps to get the biggest profit while providing a top quality product to our customers. And by doing it with drying our leftover flowers that would otherwise be composted, um, just is a great added value product. And um, you know, you notice there's no sunflowers here. Sunflowers do dry beautifully, but we never have any left over <laughs> to be able to do it. And that's my goal next year is um, to save some of those so we can show you. Um, and I, I dried Rudbeckias. They were awesome. Um, and so, friends, I just think this is a great opportunity. Friends, if you'd like to learn more about how to grow all these flowers, um, I invite you to thegardenersworkshop.com where you can find Flower Farm and School Online, um, my class, The Basics, um, Annual Crops, Marketing and More, and Dave Dowling's Bulbs, Perennials, and Woodies and More. And then we also um, are just so pleased to have Stephen Gretel Adams of Sunny Meadows doing our growing cut flower crops and hoop and greenhouses. Friends, all three of those courses will just set you up for being a pro and carrying you through and answering your questions. Um, and they have great communities to go along with them. So find that all over at thegardenersworkshop.com. And remember our sister podcast, um, Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane, where we talk all about starting from seed and all those types of related issues. And friends, until we meet again, ciao.